So we just got back yesterday, um, came back down from Scotland and from the Lake District. That's a long way away, I have to just say. That's quite a drive. Um, but it's a lovely time that we had up on the Hebrides. We went to a conference that was specifically talking about the Hebridean revival that happened in the end of the 1940s and into the 50s, where God broke out in an amazing way, where in a church where two old ladies, Peggy and Christine Smith, had been praying for young people to come. They bemoaned and bewailed the state of the church. They dedicated themselves to prayer. They looked to their church leaders on the aisle and said, not being funny, but you lot need to... They didn't say this exactly. This is a South London translation. You lot need to get yourself together and actually gather around and start praying for young people to come into the church. And they started having 10 p.m. to 3 a.m., three times a week prayer meetings, crying out to God. And during that time, a young deacon came and recited in one of the meetings, Psalm 24, about clean hands and pure hearts. And something broke in the room and people came to repent. And then the people were gathering and more people gathered and gathered. And then one day, in a, one of the churches in Barvas, uh, in the sort of just north of Stornway, the capital, a blacksmith came in one night and started praying covenantal prayers. What I mean by that is he had been and experienced Jesus, been regenerated, restored and transformed. And he started reading these promises in the Bible and he said, you've written it here, so why can't you do it again? And he stood in that space and said, Isaiah 44, which is about the pouring water onto dry ground. That was the promise they'd received as a church, as a Hebridean, I was going to say nation, but that would all kick off. But as a Hebridean place, they'd got that promise. And then he started this blacksmith saying, okay, God, I believe in you. This is your promise. And I now declare that and call that down in this place. And the room shook and outside 300 people had gathered independently, unaware, but just drawn to the church. And so we'd been there and we went to a conference for three days. It was great. But one of the things that left me, struck me, was the reason they were having the conference in this church in Stornoway, the Church of Scotland, nothing to do with the Church of England or Anglicans, I learnt, but the Church of Scotland, Presbyterians, was this was one of the churches that God bypassed in the revival. That actually, God didn't move in this church. Stornoway as a town missed out on what God was doing Because the preacher stood up and started preaching against what was happening in the rest of the aisle. They started saying and being cynical and not saying it was a move of God. But thousands came to faith. But still to this day, Stornoway is marked and scarred by the fact that they preached against what was happening in the 1940s and 50s. And so it made me think, because I have that previous career in me uh, as a police officer, that sometimes I can be cynical and look and think, ah, and compare. And actually it's like, oh my goodness, I don't want to be a church like that. So I said lots of times in the last few months that God goes where he's wanted. Do we want him? And I'll come to more of that later because that was expanded about in it. But we've had a great sort of time on that conference. And four and a half sort of days of rest we've kind of worked out. we are reflected on where God has worked in the last six years of our ministry here. Me and Liz just praying, seeking God diligently having fun on electric bikes I've got to say I am transformed Mickey don't worry with that push pedal stuff without that that, don't worry about that put a motor behind you and it's easy it was so good going up on the fells going past these proper mountain bikers as I pedaled at 16 miles an hour up going (laughs) bye-bye but we had great fun on that and we had great fun walking and delighting in God we also dedicated each day to God and said Put people in our way. Speak to us. We saw a sign saying, Eddie, great, or something like that. Was it Eddie? took a picture by it. But he said, a picture of Eddie. It's like, oh my goodness, Eddie's on the walk. We had pictures and signs of St. John's over and over again. But there was this moment that I'd love to speak a little bit about today. I've got a talk prepared. I may not even go anywhere near that. But there was a bit when we picked up the electric bikes, it was in a place called Lowther Castle. And they had to close the whole castle down because they had a water leak. And so the only people in the castle were me and Liz and this 50, 60, 50, late 50-year-old 50 
guy called Andy. And Andy was putting the bikes out to be hired. And uh, we were the only ones hiring. Uh, we were the only ones who caught the vision of electric bikes. And uh, just, we went on our boat ride. We came back and he was there still waiting for us three hours later. And we started chatting. Andy, I don't know how he come to it, but uh, I think I might have said it's, that I was a vicar, different things like that. But the conversation went on to Andy's daughter. Andy's daughter committed suicide at the age of 28. She was a nurse. Uh, she was uh, successful in that nurse onco oncological, like a, a certain type of nurse. <laughs> I don't ever, thank the Lord I'm not a doctor, we'd be in trouble. He's going, what department have you sent me to? Oh no. But she was a nurse. She had marriage troubles and separated from her husband because of something that happened. And she got herself in a deep, dark place. And no one knew it. She masked it entirely. She got a new job promoted, moved, was due to move to Edinburgh. And on, I think, the 28th or 29th, took her own life, completely unexpected. And he wasn't a Christian. He was from Cumbria, but his local vicar turned up. No, it's Martin, it was his name. We went to see Martin Walker as well while we were out there. It wasn't Martin, but it was the vicar came around, Martin. And the vicar just sat there and didn't speak anything about God. But he just said, I just want to say there will be hope beyond this. And that's the only word I've got for you is hope. What he didn't realize was that was the seed that kept Andy going. That seed of hope. And he didn't know what it was. He subsequently wrote a book about the people that he met. He formed a charity with two other dads called The Three Dads. You might have seen it on the news. They've walked the length of the country. There's a fireman. All have lost daughters to suicide. And he said that word that the vicar said about hope kept him going in what he would describe as praying. And what that came with stories. Dan Walker wrote a chapter in his book about these three dads as inspirational figures. When he came to write the chapter about the vicar and what he had come and said, when he went to see the vicar and got his permission and said, can I talk about the hope you spoke about? He said, I don't remember saying any of that. <laughs> but that's what Andy took away. And so what I'd like to say today as we step into this subject of prayer, it can bring up all sorts of things. And I just want to just say a huge thank you first to those who've done the prayer stations. It was beautiful the last few days. Helped us connect with God so deeply. But when we talk about prayer, there'll be disappointment that comes up. There'll be stuff of, why did someone die? Or why haven't you done that? Why haven't you restored that? There'll be inevitably stuff about disappointment. There's always something about comparison. Why did they pray and get healed? But there's something mysterious and beautiful and powerful about prayer. It is the center of our faith because it is about our relationship with Jesus, about the living God, with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As Christians or those exploring faith, we're called to pray. There isn't a shortage of prayer in the world. About 90% of people say that they pray. Yet we see the church in decline. We know that prayers there, Muslims will hit the floor five times a day on their rugs and kneel and recite the Quran. Hindus will create gods and pray to gods, including Sachin Tandolka, who's a cricketer. But there'll be many places to pray. Buddhists will empty themselves to a state of meditation, of enlightenment. And everywhere in the world right now, there'll be an atheist in a hospital room with their head between their knees, praying to a God they don't believe in. We've all prayed. Those Hail Mary prayers, last minute. God, if you pull through on this, I'll do this. Anyone who's taken an exam has said that prayer before. And so prayer is something that we're wired for. One rabbi described it as that it's our surprise that humanity leads us to pray. But as Christians, we pray to the way, the truth, and the life that is Jesus Christ. We pray to the God of the Bible. 
We keep our eyes on him, his son, Jesus Christ. And that's what we're looking at this morning as we unpack scripture. It's what did Jesus do? And how do we do what Jesus did? How do we pray? I think we've got a really limited capacity to pray in the West right now. I find it hard. I find it exhausting. We told the story of being in New York in February, six hours in a prayer room. Prayer is inefficient and tiring. Yet it's the place that we're restored. And we find rest. Bizarrely. It's counterintuitive, isn't it? Let's read some scripture. Mark. We're on the journey of Mark. Jesus has started his ministry. He's not done so badly so far. He's cast out some evil spirits. He's called the disciples and he's healed many. And then we get to Mark 1, chapter, uh, verse 35. This sings to my heart. Anyone on the team here will know these two words sings to my heart. Very early in the morning... While it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they explained, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I've come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. So just go back to the start of the reading, Amanda, that'd be amazing. So very early in the morning. I could do a whole preach about rhythms and routines, which I think are really important. I could do another one about silence and solitude, of getting away, not being distracted or drifting in our prayer life. I think they're all really important. I could talk about very early in the morning, but as Pete did, he came with Psalm 127. It's a theological student's kind of joke. When he sort of preached and said, anyone who doesn't build a house on the Lord will build in vain. Those who rise in the morning and and go to bed late at night pray in vain. So he's countering the very early in the morning. But I think there's something about starting a day with Jesus, whatever that looks like. I think he got up very early in the morning because he wanted time alone. He wanted time separate, away from the crowds. He wanted time intimate with his father. Whatever we do in life, we need to have that intimacy one-on-one with our father, Abba. And through the power of the Spirit with his son, Jesus Christ. And so what we see in prayer is Jesus always coming back to it because it comes back to relationships. I think that intimacy is what Andy found in that word of hope when he talked about his daughter who died at 28. We have lots of ways to pray nowadays. You can do the examinen, you can do a prayer journal, you can do Ignatian prayer through a story, you can pray through the Psalms, you can have models of silence and solitude, you can gather in two or threes. You can have that rhythm and routine, the devotions around the table, but it's about a prayer-soaked life. You know, we've talked many times in the last few months about Lizzie's mum and dad, Jimmy and Diane, how they were soaked throughout in prayer. They held our marriage together with the prayers that they prayed. They brought me to faith through those prayers. They were so diligent in their prayer life. I think sometimes we haven't got capacity or we haven't got depth in our prayers. I think if you look at the East African revival, they say it being about a mile, miles wide and only an inch deep. I think that's our walk with Jesus. Our discipleship can be quite wide but not very deep. I think the prayer that we're being called to as a church is always to have deep prayers. It's having those spaces that we go deeper and capacity. It's going beyond a 15-minute devotion in the morning and giving an hour to an hour and a half to prayer. I think Jesus got up very early in the morning because he wanted more time with his father before he was interrupted. I think... 
prayer needs to be the center of our church. It needs to be the start. Doesn't mean that we don't do social mission. Doesn't mean we don't do great teaching or character school. Doesn't mean we worship really, not we don't worship well. But prayer has got to be the center of our church. And how do we do that? Because I think when we do, and we spend time in his presence, meditating on his word, when we diligently seek him, our prayers change. I've said that story already. It's a time to linger, to be with. I wonder what church would look like in the next few months if we lingered to pray. If we came and asked questions about what was spoken about or what God was saying about. That we do the community part, this is really important, but actually we don't run off at one o'clock because we've got something to eat, which I can do. But actually we want to be praying for each other and with each other and to God. I wonder what it looks like if we have a spirit of lingering and waiting. I wonder what it looks like if you're all in power to pray for one another and see breakthrough. Very early in the morning. This is where Jesus got his purpose, his power, and he came into the presence of the living God. We are praying to an approachable God. God is approaching us, or as we sang, running after us. We are praying to an approachable God. Are we approaching him with our time? Do we give it to him? You see, the story of mankind, humanity, is a story of a people that reject God over and over again. Even the angels is a story of one of the angels, Satan, rejecting God. Then God had some plans. Adam and Eve rejected God. Then Noah came along, came up with the ark and people rejected him. Then they rejected God and wanted a king. Story of rejection of God. And then Jesus came and humanity rejected him. God is approachable. Are we rejecting him time and time again? With the business of church, business of life, and the distractions of the world. God is approachable. And we have an approachable and jealous God. What he values, he seems to value, is our prayers of repentance, our prayers of unity, our prayers of holiness, and our prayers of calling in his kingdom. He's available 24-7. How much have we made available to him? Noah came, nobody listened. Pharaoh didn't listen. Israel didn't listen. Judas didn't listen. And the Pharisees rejected Jesus. To pray is to cleanse, sacrifice and devote our lives to Jesus. When you hear about stories of heroes of faith, all of them, I'd have yet to hear one, please do come up to me, a deep people of prayer. Be that Charles Spurgeon, Hudson Taylor, Eric Liddell, Julian of Norwich, Catherine of Siena, Mother Teresa, deep people of prayer. To be used as ordinary people for the glory of God, we've got to increase our capacity and our heart for prayer. And I'm talking to myself because I've got so busy with running a church, I forgot the most important pose that I can have as a minister of the church is on my knees, praying to the Father of all. We must keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Jesus didn't have a pious religious prayer life. He had an intimate, active, alive and central and joyful prayer life calling on the name of his father. He often prayed after spiritually dramatic uh, events to restore himself. You know, in the launch of his ministry, as we see, in the feeding of the 5,000, in the sending out of the 72, Jesus withdraws after things that have taken his energy. 
what me and Liz have been doing in the last 10 days is trying to restore some of that energy with God. And then Jesus also prays, prays at key moments in his life, at his baptism, when he chooses the 12, at his transfiguration, in the Garden of the Gethsemane. Often it's to refocus and come back to his mission and purpose of life. He comes back at his baptism and he knows the cross. Comes back at the transfiguration and knows he's heading to the cross. He comes back at the Garden of Gethsemane and comes back to his mission and purpose. If we're going to be people of purpose for God, we're to come back in prayer. To dedicate that time. To increase our capacity from maybe 15 minutes to being hours of intercessions. How do we pray? I could do a six-week course and they've done those. We're not doing that this morning. You'll be pleased to know. There's all sorts of different prayers, as I say. We've been comfort prayers, wistful prayers, regulated, intercessory, Hail Marys. I think the time that we found in doing the Psalms, five times, uh, five Psalms uh, each day, and praying through that has really helped us. I think dedicating an hour and a half, three times a week has really helped us as a couple. And praying and fasting once a week, in pressing in, I think there's... A, you know, something in the spiritual temperature of where we are now that can only be broken through prayer and fasting. I think if there's difficulties you're facing, prayer and fasting makes a massive difference. When we're making decisions, we pray and fast. We think we're being called back into a praying fasting season again. But I think those sort of areas enables you to pray because prayer is a conversation with God. It's both knowing the intimate person that we come to, that we call Father, Abba. But it's also knowing who we're praying to, which is the creator of the universe. We believe in a God that's bigger than big, yet closer than close. I think what really helps when we're praying, especially when we're praying these contending prayers, when we're praying for things to move in our lives, in the move of others, is gathering other people to pray with on a consistent basis. We used to have pattern groups here. I'm not relaunching pattern, but do get in groups of same sex, I'd suggest, twos and threes, and start contending for aspects of your life. If you've got different phases of your life coming up, if you're getting married, if you're thinking of starting a family, if you're changing careers, if you've got difficulties in different aspects of your life, gather two or three people that you really trust and know. And I know some of you have been through this before, but maybe this is a new season to go. I need you to stand with me and pray with me. Here's the thing that kept me in ministry. Without Sid, Pete and Ben, my closest friends in ministry, I would not be standing here. They have held my hands up when they flagged down. They've listened to me when I said, I'm done. And I've done the same for them. They have dealt with some of the things that I needed to sort out so I can minister well. Don't do it on your own. Jesus, when he goes to God of Gethsemane, gets three people that fall asleep. So there's always hope. So pray together. James 5, verses 16 to 18. If you just stick that up. We're just going to look at this briefly. We're going to go much more into more detail tonight. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I stop myself there because I think there's no way I can be righteous. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. But guess what? It's the righteousness of Christ given to us that we stand in. What you need to do, what I need to do is accept that for myself. Do you remember it's not holiness, it's not being perfect. But it's about walking in our weakness and our brokenness with Jesus. And so a prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being. Have a look. I haven't got time to unpack it. Have a look at Elijah. He's not the most wonderful um, person of faith. He does run away. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. He prayed earnestly. 
When I said that the church was diligently seeking God in this season, Liz reminded me that actually the word that she had was earnest. I was like, oh yeah, uh, but I think they're very similar. I think what God cares about when you pray is your heart. Are you earnest? Are you earnest for him? The prayers of a righteous person. I think where I think we've been called to as we sort of, I just want to open today about prayer is get a hunger and a heart. And I think so often our prayers have ended up being just about ourselves. I think there's sometimes when we are looking up to God and lift our eyes, we do. But sometimes when we turn in on ourselves, we spend our time just looking at ourselves and we never get to lift our eyes. One of the verses given to me when I came to faith was Psalm 121. Where does your help come from? Lift your eyes to the Lord. And so I think sometimes we're called to lift our eyes and to pray. And so how do we pray? I'm praying that you'd look at Nehemiah this week as a opening chapter because I think Nehemiah gives us an indication of of the times that we're in to how we should pray. Nehemiah tells a story of a cupbearer to the king of the Babylonians. The people of God had been taken into exile. They took the elite first, then they took um, then they got the uh, Jewish people to intermarry in their uh, occupation. And then they sent back some people that had been intermarried and to be culturally bringing the Babylonians into Israel. And so Nehemiah is the cupbearer in the king's court. And he decides to have a kingdom-sized vision, not a personal one. And so I think our personal prayers are really important. I think God is really interested in our personal prayers. But I think he's calling for a church to be centered around kingdom prayers, kingdom vision prayers, rather than personal prayers. Sometimes our prayers can be about our personal prosperity and peace when God is looking at for us to be slightly discomforted. And so I think, first of all, read Nehemiah this week. I haven't got time to do it this morning. But Nehemiah gets a kingdom-sized prayer about rebuilding the, the temple in Jerusalem. We are in racks and ruins in this nation as a church and as a nation. You see more anxiety. Yet we see signs of hope and life as we stand and be with each other in church. And so have a kingdom, not a personal vision, I think, in some aspects of our corporate prayer. Secondly, I think we should call to lift our eyes. As I said in Psalm 121, I'd, I'd love the advertising for the send. Anyone look to the send? Anyone heard of the send? There's a few hands going up. It's brilliant. The Send is a gathering on the 7th of July in Wembley Stadium with the youth of the nation. We're sending some people from here. We're in the Hebrides in a very cold church uh, that was uh, full of youth that are going and seeking to get tab. You know, we've just been up there. They're coming to Wembley and they're gathering as people, as young people to pray in for the kingdom of God to come in kingdom-sized prayers. And uh, they use on their advertising the Billy Graham voice. Do you remember the story of Billy Graham? As a young theological student, he comes over to do a revival tour. And he's in London with his theological students. Uh, He's one of them. And they lose him and they don't know where he's gone. And they find him in Charles Wesley's bedroom, kneeling down exactly where Wesley prayed. And he was praying the prayer, you did it then, can you do it again? You did it then, can you do it again? And that's what the young people are gathering in the Wembley Stadium, is to pray, you did it then, can you do it again? God goes where he's wanted. So we need to lift our eyes into those covenantal prayers. Thirdly, I think, I've got a slide I think that this comes up for, so that would be great. Great. A crystallization of 
discontent. Crystallization of discontent is a psychology term. It's when someone realizes that they need to leave a cult or an abusive marriage. They have that moment of clarity. There's a crystallization of discontent. It's when you sometimes have to leave a place because there's been a, dis a crystallization of discontent. This is about stepping into the burden that God has given you. I challenged the team before we left to pray a prayer. The prayer is a dangerous prayer, and it's my challenge to us today. is to ask God for what his burden is for Crawley and this place. What is God's? We've got our agendas, haven't we? We've got the things we'd like to see come in. We've got all the things, the programs we'd like to see step into and see where God breaks into. We've got to do a lot of talking to God, but I wonder what his burden is for this place. I wonder if it's time to spend an hour and a half, two hours, just seeking him this week. What is God's burden in this place because his burden will be about transformed lives but I don't know what it looks like here it is a big prayer to pray but each of you will be burdened with something in the kingdom of God there'll be something that pushes your buttons that makes you mad and sad I think for me Still is Natasha McCook, that 12-year-old girl with 500 rocks of crack cocaine in her bra and a knife down her back being sexually abused by a gang when my oldest daughter was the same age. That's a burden that I need to stare at each day and say, not on my watch. Lord, come and move in this place. There'll be other burdens that you've been given. My burden often is to have a hunger for Jesus and see people transformed by that love of Jesus Christ. What is your burden? And so, have a kingdom vision, not a personal one. Lift your eyes, have a crystallization of discontent. Sometimes we numb ourselves where we don't want to feel things. I think we do need to hang out in the sad places. This kind of prayer is not quick and fast. This is travailing and tears. Someone recounted reading a scripture yesterday and tears. That's melting our heart for Jesus. We need to get to a point of travailing and tears because then we feel what God looks at us when we walk away or we're astray. We need to have soft hearts. I think in today's world, we can numb our hearts down, we can distract our hearts, we can harden our hearts, but actually we're called to have soft hearts. No matter what we've been through, no matter what we're going through, don't harden your hearts today. I think this leads to a number of different kinds of prayers. I think when we step into this prayers, we have prayers of repentance quickly come up. That's quick. I was like, prayers of repentance. I think we need to repent sometimes of the church. Sometimes, if you watch Nehemiah, he doesn't repent for what he's done. He repents on what his generations have done. Actually, we might say, oh, that's not our responsibility. That wasn't on our watch. I've said that to the previous generation of clergy. I genuinely have. Need to repent of saying that. But actually, if Jesus never turned around to me and said, I'm not, you're not my responsibility. He went to the cross and he intercedes for me. So I need to take prayers of repentance both corporately and individually seriously. Prayers of promise. We need to step into those prayers of promise. We read so many promises and blessings in scripture. We need to claim them. Not in a name and claim kind of way, but we need to pray through them. We need to know them to pray. The reason why the blacksmith's prayer connected with God's prayer, I think, is because he was praying through scripture. Isaiah 44, come and do what you said you would go and do. That's a covenantal prayer. Calling on the name of the Lord. So prayers of promise. Prayers of faith. Prayers of faith. He holds on to us. He's got this and he's got us. But he's looking to partner with me and you in these prayers of faith. If you unpick and tonight we will do a little bit Nehemiah. 
into this story. They are prayers of repentance, prayers of promise, prayers of faith. As we close and go into prayer ministry. I think God is saying to me in this time. I often look for a new word and go, oh God, we've gone away. Speak to me again. I'll read the Bible. He always speaks to me in some shape or form. But specifically, he's taking me back to some of the passages he's given to me in the past. He's saying to me, I've given you a word, Steve. All I want you to do is live it. I've given you a word, Steve. All I want to do is you to live it. But under my strength, not yours. Not the way you thought it was going to be done, but the way I'm going to do it through you. So he's taking me back to Psalm 121. He's taking me back to Romans uh, chapter, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. That, is that, do we get that up or not? Yeah, did. This is the faith. This is the verse that I came to faith with. Having seen lots of trauma in the police, lots of things I didn't understand about the death of my sister. But God's taken me to this and said, go and live this. Not only so, but we also glorify in our sufferings. Really? Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And the hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. It's good. We've got to get better at that, haven't we? <laughs> it's a hope that doesn't disappoint. And so as we go through sufferings, as we persevere, as he makes us and forms us into the character of his son, Jesus Christ, we have the hope, a hope that doesn't disappoint. I spoke on it yesterday at a Catholic conference about the hope of Christ. Read Psalm 23. It's all there. In his guidance, in his rest, in his being bigger than big and closer than close. It's all there. So I wonder as a church, we need to corporately start praying for this nation as Emily did in worship time. That we need to claim Ezekiel 47 again, Exodus 14, 14, Isaiah 61. But step in through the strength of Christ, through a praying church, not a doing church. And then action will come from that. And so should we stand? So just going to ask the Holy Spirit who's here just to be moving amongst us. If you read Nehemiah, in 52 days he did what they couldn't do in 52 years. What revival is, is the acceleration of the Holy Spirit working in a place amongst renewed people. I genuinely think, as I speak to other church leaders, as things are bubbling in this nation and across the world, God is moving in the younger generation. I don't want to be a stone away church. But what he's asking us to do is prepare to prayer, prepare for prayer on our knees. So we pray that we just be empowered now to speak to us. I think prayer ministry time will happen this morning, but it will be, do you want that capacity to pray? Do you want that increased capacity to pray? Do you find it hard to keep your quiet time? Do you get distracted and do you drift? Are you praying in your own strength or the strength of the Spirit? Are there things that you need to see change in your life? That's what we're going to pray for this morning. In ministry time. It's going to need an army. But an army starts, as Pete Gregg would say, on its knees in prayer. God isn't looking for the battles you're going to fight for him. He's looking used to be used in the battle he's fighting. It's a subtle difference.
Come, Holy Spirit, come. our prayers need to be honest, open and real but hopeful hopeful so if I can ask the prayer ministry